It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. It is the Monday, November 7th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. And you can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. I ruffled some feathers yesterday in the strength and conditioning community on Twitter. And I had no idea that I had done such a thing because I didn't think that the tweet that I sent out was that uh, controversial. I will say that. Um, But regardless, here we are. It is what it is. So on today's show, we've got the rugby strength coach on Twitter. He is... uh, uh, his name is uh, Kier, and he is fantastic, uh, at rugby underscore str underscore coach on Twitter. Go check him out. Fantastic dude. Uh, did not make fun of me for the things that I do not know about. He just enlightened us. He educated us, and we're going to have his interview towards the end of the show. I'm not going to spend too long as far as news, et cetera, is concerned, because I want you to listen to him for as long as we had him, uh, but fantastic guy. Uh, I highly recommend that you go follow him and go check out his courses, etc. Uh, I am I am likely to get involved over there because I would like to fix myself up. To be completely honest, but uh, but we will see what uh, what is going on with that. Go and listen to the interview towards the end of the show. Uh, the show every time is brought to you by BetUS. That's right, it's America's premier online sports book. They are fantastic. I highly recommend that you go and check out BetUS.com. I also host. The BetUS College Football Show. Every Tuesday and Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Parker, Kyle, and myself, we go through the games where we find the most value, along with the biggest games of the week. So check out BetUS. Check out the BetUS College Football Show. Check out BetUSTV.com as well. There are links in the description. Make sure that you can go and subscribe over there uh, very easily. So go ahead and check out the link in the description for that. Let's, uh, let's dive into some news from today's show. Uh, well, not from today's show, but from the college football world right now. Jeff Scott, of course, was fired on Sunday afternoon at South Florida. Uh, USF going to be looking for a new coach. Daniel DePrado um, is the special teams coach, but he is the new interim. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I can't talk. The new interim coach at South Florida. Uh, this is a job that... You know, Jeff Scott, I believe, only had one FBS win in his three seasons there. Uh, They are now 1-8 and this season after losing to Temple. Uh, I mean, just got whipped. I think it was 54-28, to 54-27, something like that. I mean, they they got obliterated in that second half, and Temple is not a good football team. So, you had a feeling this was going to be coming. Uh, A lot of people obviously talking. We talked about it on the show. If Jeff Scott were to be fired, would Clemson hire him back? Good question. Uh, We'll see what ends up happening with that. Uh, But a lot of names in the candidate pool, they include Tom Herman, Dan Mullen, Scott Frost, and then you've got the assistant coaches route where you've got Georgia running back coach Del McGee, uh, Florida State offensive coordinator Alex Atkins, et cetera. There's a lot of guys that could be good fits for this job, and I really have no idea which direction the athletic department wants to go. I won't even venture to make a guess right now because I don't think even they had... uh, I don't think that they had planned on it going so poorly this year. They wanted to keep him around for a fourth season, uh, but it was just not going well. So they make the change, and then they get all their ducks in a row, and they will figure out what they want to do at the end of the season. Uh, I don't believe that there is any name that is leading the pack currently, from what I have been told. So we'll see what ends up happening at South Florida. But this is uh, a job that is highly coveted uh, among a, a certain segment of the coaching community. And I would not be surprised to see them get a, a good name that I think can do really, really well there. Moving along, Dan Patrick reported this morning that San Diego State to the Pac-12. That's right, we're talking Pac-12 expansion. Going to toss it in there. But, uh, but he said that that is going to happen this week. It was quickly, quickly refuted by Nicole Auerbach, among others. But Nicole Auerbach has good sources inside of the Pac-12. And what she was told... Uh, of course, over at The Athletic, she says that her source told her that that is an inaccurate report. The Pac-12 will do their media deal before any conference expansion. Now, I am very interested in this because I feel like it would in it would be in the Pac-12's best interest to expand 
before you go to the table for a media deal. But I suppose if you are still trying to negotiate, if you're still trying to figure things out, you want to know exactly what the value would be of bringing in somebody else, right? So if you're still in that feeling out phase, then maybe maybe I can understand that, right? San Diego State to the Pac-12 makes absolutely perfect sense. You have lost your LA footprint. Bring in another major market in San Diego. Uh, you're going to stay in that uh, Southern Cal area. I could understand it. It makes all the sense in the world because they fit, right? Uh, are they a huge program? No, but the potential is there for them to be. So we'll see. We'll see what ends up happening with that. I'm, again, highly, highly curious. I feel like you would want to have somebody in the fold, but you also don't want to bring in somebody that is going to cost more money per school as far as you know the mouths that you have to feed, right? Is your media deal going to be worth more per school without San Diego State than with? Or would they give the same share to San Diego State if they were to bring them in? That's where it all gets a little squirrely. I feel like having more content would be good, but how many viewers are you really going to get on Amazon or ESPN or whatever it may be with a San Diego State-Washington State matchup, right? Is that is that worth 200,000 viewers? What is that worth to ESPN to have that in the late-night window? You know, et cetera. And this is not a slight to Washington State. I am having to be very careful with this because a lot of people seem to take personal offense when I when I bring up examples of TV ratings or viewership, right? And not only that, but like just other things. But regardless, this is not a slight on Washington State or San Diego State or whatever. I don't know what the ratings actually would be. But just based on what we have seen on a late Saturday night on FS1 or wherever the deal may be done, not a ton of viewers for a game along those lines. Oregon State, San Diego State, who knows, right? Uh, Arizona and Oregon State, Arizona, San Diego State. Okay, Arizona, Arizona and San Diego State to start college football season on CBS did less than a million viewers. Just throwing it out there. So, um, very curious what's going to happen as far as Pac-12 expansion, but alas, here we are. Uh, the last thing that I want to bring up, the Auburn Daily is reporting that Auburn and Oregon coach Dan Lanning have mutual interest that Dan Lanning would be interested in coming back to the Southeastern Conference. Remember, he was Georgia's defensive coordinator uh, for the national title season, and of course, before that. But uh, Georgia appears to be doing just fine now, even with Lanning gone. Uh, but Lanning does understand the Southeastern Conference uh, footprint. While it would make sense, do we really think that Oregon is going to let him go after one season after the embarrassment of Mario Cristobal leaving, right after Willie Taggart leaving? Like, no, I don't believe that this is going to happen. I think Lanning is not going to leave a place that he has already built into a winner. Like, it was it was already pre-built before he got there. And he uncovered some of the things that were not being done and took advantage of the speed and the talent that he's already got there. Uh, we'll see what Oregon does for the rest of the season, but I do not believe that Dan Lanning has any interest. And John Canzano... Uh, agreed with that sentiment. He said that that is not happening and that whoever is reporting this apparently forgot to ask Dan Lanning because to Dan Lanning, there is no mutual interest. He is not interested in going to Auburn. So we'll see what happens, you know, in the future, et cetera. Lanning is a young guy. Um, you know, he's from more of the Missouri area, but he's been all over the Southeastern Conference. He, he was at Memphis for a little while, uh, ended up at Georgia, blah, 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 blah. You get the deal. So, yeah, I'm I'm curious about this. Uh, I think Auburn, I think the name that will come out at Auburn will be somebody that nobody is talking about. I don't believe it will, it will be Lane Kiffin. I don't believe it will be Hugh Freeze. I don't believe it will be Deion Sanders. I think it's somebody that everybody will view as a really, really good hire and that nobody is discussing. Just a little... Just a little tidbit. All right, let's uh, let's go on and hit an ad on the backside. That's right, the rugby strength coach is going to tell us what is going wrong at Alabama. He's going to try and explain toughness, among other things. Uh, he will educate us, and by God, did I need some education. So this was a really, really fascinating interview. I was very happy that he hopped on with us, but definitely, definitely wait around for the interview. 
Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit betustv.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, on today's show, we are uh, happy to be joined by an actual certified badass on the show. Kier Winham Flat is with us. He is at rugby underscore str underscore coach. And I will go ahead and, and start this thing off and tell you, one, you can find him over at rugbystrengthcoach.com. But two, uh, I shared out a tweet on Sunday that was, uh, I feel misconstrued, but uh, but man, did it get some traction quite a bit in what I have been told is the strength and conditioning Twitter community, which I did not, like, I know that there's niches for everything, but I didn't know that this one ran as deep as it did. So, Kier, let me let me bring you in here. It, tell everybody about yourself first, but then explain, you know, uh, S&C Twitter for me. My background is horrible athlete growing up. Wanted to be as close to the field as I could be, which is the sidelines. And um, yeah, strength coach by trade. Started out in the UK uh, in professional rugby. Did three years there. Three years back and forth between Australia and Argentina. Two years in Tokyo. Had enough of rugby. Jumped across to the States to uh, college football. And I've been in the States for the past four years. And uh, as I described to you uh, previously uh, off the air, I transitioned to coach education in the last couple of years to look after my son because I ended up being uh, a single parent, which not really conducive to uh, collegiate sport. Um, but yeah, man, the you know the strength and conditioning community. I think there's there, there's a number of factors that that make them so touchy about stuff like that. One is because there's just huge nepotism that goes on in the field. The and, you know, everyone's everyone's got that guy. So when when you say, you know, things might have been better with this other guy. Well, let's say, hey, actually, let me let me read the tweet and then, sure, uh, right, and then yeah, we'll yeah. attack it from there. So I, I yeah. said on this, uh, I think it's safe to say that the Bama dynasty went into decline with the change in strength coaches. I said, while it worked beautifully for Alabama in 2020, uh, this team has not been, quote, tough on offensive line or defensive line since Scott Cochran left. So that's the tweet that that caused the uproar. And yeah. and at no point was it meant to be an attack on David Ballou or the rest of the strength staff at Alabama currently. Yeah. Uh, what, what I was really trying to put forward is the toughness of the team. The identity at Alabama has yeah. always been tough in the trenches, nasty you get that push when you need it you know that that is the one thing the culture at Alabama was whipping people at the line of scrimmage and they have not been able to do that really uh, it may have started even before Cochran left to be completely fair it hasn't been the exact same as it was for a decade right mm -hmm. and when you look at you know Scott Cochran was really credited with establishing that culture there um but man, you know, he went on 60 Minutes and, and there were specials on ESPN, et cetera, about this guy builds monsters, et cetera. After 2019, he goes over to Georgia for an on-field role as a special teams coordinator and things start to fall off at Alabama. Now, you wouldn't think that Cochran would be involved with necessarily recruiting, et cetera, because of all the NCAA rules back then. But that's what I was initially implying with this tweet. Not an attack on the current coaching staff, but or at least not the current strength staff. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. we could talk about assistant coaches all day, uh, but but I'm I'm very curious to hear uh, your your side of this and why it may have been misinterpreted that way. 
I mean, if B follows A, does it mean that A cause B? You know, oh, every yeah. every summer in the US, the murder rate spikes, as does consumption of ice cream. Is the consumption of ice cream driving murders? Or is it the temperature making people simultaneously want ice cream and be bad tempered, you know, and, and in social gatherings? So, you know, certainly one thing can follow, follow another. It doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's causing it. Right. Uh, so correlation does not mean causation, for sure. sure. For sure. So when you talk about toughness, do you agree that if you are going to define a word, the definition shouldn't be arguable? The less arguable that definition becomes, the more useful it becomes, right? That You've got a very good point there because I don't know how you necessarily define tough, exactly. right? Yeah. How do you well, define so, uh, nasty in the term? Like, yeah. you, you, there's no real quantifiable way to measure uh, I guess somebody's sure heart is. or whatever, right? Sure. I, well, no, no, you, you, you can get closer, but let, let's look at it this way, right? Okay. Uh, a great definition would be something from, from physics. Speed is distance divided by time, inarguable. I say speed, you know what I mean. You say speed, I know what you mean. We're speaking the same language. So there's no miscommunication in the transfer of information. We know exactly what it is. We know how to define it, measure it, track it. It's It's super useful. Right. To say that I want to be tough is as vague as saying I want to be handsome. <laughs> so let's let's look at all these different examples that we can cite in sport and outside of sport about people who are tough. So, for example, if you're a if you're a Wall Street trader and you can keep focus, steady, not succumb to your emotions with billions of dollars of other people's money on the line, you're tough, right? I would just, yeah. Yeah, I think so. If you can be a surgeon, do like these fine motor tasks and know that if you mess it up, the guy's going to die, you're tough. If sure. you can um, tolerate a lot of emotional abuse and hardship, social worker, for example, tough. If you can bear with a lot of pain, uh, you're tough. If you can um, be a combat sport athlete and you know step into a cage, with a lot of people watching you and be aggressive, you're tough. So in reality, just like when you say, well, I want to be handsome, you might be looking at like facial symmetry, you know, your teeth, your skin, your hair, your build, all these different things. When you talk about toughness, what you're really talking about is an umbrella term for a lot of different uh, characteristics. So it might be emotional regulation, your ability to uh, focus on a task, to communicate clearly, to demonstrate aggressiveness, to um, tolerate adversity, to um, tolerate pain. These are all different qualities. So would you agree with the idea that if you can be an, I don't think anyone would disagree, if you can be an NCAA Division One champion uh, wrestler, you're tough. Agreed. Okay. If you can stick to a rigorous diet and a horrible weight cut, you're tough. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Johnny Hendricks won a national championship uh, in the NCAA wrestling, won the welterweight belt in the UFC, notorious for not being able to stick to a diet, fair, and missed weight five times in his career. Simultaneously tough and not tough or there's there's nuance and there's flavors to toughness and the the likelihood is is that really there's 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 aspects to to toughness so, so this is excuse me for interrupting but yeah, go ahead, yeah. Uh, so this is something else that could be you know not necessarily a strength and conditioning thing but would would mental conditioning be considered part of strength and conditioning because one of the guys that was credited early with yeah. Alabama's you know identity that they created for themselves was Trevor Mowad, who, you know, unfortunately passed in September of, of last season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a guy that really helped establish uh, the work ethic, et cetera, at Alabama. Now, he had not worked in Tuscaloosa in quite some time, but he was still very involved with uh, with Nick Saban and with those assistant coaches, et cetera. Uh, but the mental aspect of it, is that a big part of uh, the strength and conditioning part? It's a part of sport. So this is where the, the, the lines get a little bit blurry. So are you a strength and conditioning coach? Or are you a high performance coach? So 
sporting performance is physical, tactical, technical, and psychological. So there, there are these four areas that all athletes draw upon to achieve a successful outcome in sport. The likelihood is the higher the level you go, the closer to a 10 out of 10 you have to be in every single area. Just because there's that arms race in sport. If you're going to pick and train good enough guys, they're going to be tens across the board. As you go down the levels, you can afford to be more or less lopsided in one direction or another. So it might be, you know, FCS level, man, that team's a 10 out of 10 physically. There are five tactically, there are seven technically, and there are eight mentally. So would would mental also be, would that be part of the same, uh, I guess, spectrum as discipline? Right, because it, we we've seen Alabama have issues uh, with, you know, penalties on the road much more so. I mean, they are dead last in college football right now as far as penalties uh, away from home. Like it's, I think it's twelve point eight uh, penalties per game. Like it's it's really it's, it's a decision, right? To give away a penalty is a decision. So it's it's a mental process. Mental processes can be trained. So if you were to imagine, I'll just talk about uh, the physical. Generally, when you talk about strength and conditioning, you're talking about the physical. How do we approach the the role of being a strength coach? We look at what the sport demands, or we look at elite performers in the sport, and we say, what does it mean to be an elite football player? So what are what is the breakdown of their energy systems? What does the game demand? What does it look like when they're performing at their absolute elite? What does it mean in terms of their anthropometrics? How uh, tall heavy, muscular, lean do you have to be to be X position? What are the physical qualities look like? How fast do you have to be? Uh, How strong do you have to be? How explosive do you have to be? So then we have a profile of what it means to be elite. Then what it is, you you recruit your athletes, look at me and say, right, where is the differences between what we know you need to be and where you are right now, which is testing. You look at the test and you say, okay, good, 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 not good, not good, terrible, good. Wherever they're terrible, you know instinctively that's probably where the focus needs to be put into training to address that weak link in the chain. Because if you're good at something and you just lean on that and keep polishing it and you never address the weakness, it's always going to be a drain on performance. So then what is you you prioritize what's important, define it, measure it, find a way to stress it with training. And then as they get better, you progressively overload it and stress it more and more and more until the weak link in the chain is removed. So if you take that mental discipline and apply it to psychological performance, which is what does it mean to be an elite athlete psychologically in terms of emotional control, tolerance to pain, aggression, task focus, communication, all these different things. You say, right, is there a way that we can measure it? And it might be that you can measure it, um, quantitatively so for example you could look at kickers and say what is your completion rate for game tying or game winning field goals that would be a measure of of psychological performance because doing it in practice doing it under the stress of a game what's the difference not the task the difference is the psychological pressure correct even if you can't do it quantitatively you can use the wisdom of crowds and the experience of the coach and say okay based on 10 being the best you've ever seen Hall of Fame athlete for this quality, drawing on your experience and your opinion as a coach, where does this athlete rank for this particular quality? And across all of those um, mental qualities, there's probably going to be a weak link in the chain. So if you think about this, all right, if uh, aggression Aggression is characterized by the ability to overcome a resisting opponent. Agreed? Agreed, yes. Okay. Task um, communication requires the transfer of information from your head, sorry, my head to yours, verbally or non-verbally, but I have to get information across to you and you have to understand what it is I'm trying to get across to you. Correct, correct. If we do... uh, one tens or three hundreds is there any opponent being overcome well i guess that's so there's not a physical opponent across from you but uh there is something that you're at least trying to work through right 
pain tolerance, yeah. not aggression. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there any information being conveyed? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. I, I, yeah. I was trying to okay. search for something. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I guess not. If we've established that my weakness is my inability to overcome a resisting opponent. In rugby, you call them flat track bullies. These guys that just love to play when they're 50 points up, champagne rugby, all this kind of stuff. The second somebody gets in their face, they shit their pants. <laughs> or, you know, this this guy, can he can tolerate pain all day. He's super aggressive. You ask him to get across a clear piece of information. So, for example, scheme in uh, fourth quarter. Like, this is the plays we're going to do. You, you know, guys, that just the play goes out of their head. They can't think what it is, right? Right. And this is the Mike Tyson thing. Like everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? So if we're trying to develop qualities with tasks that look nothing like what elicits and develops those qualities, it's as useful as saying, well, I need stronger legs. So what I'm going to do is go out and run a 5K. All right? Okay. So what, what we have to do as coaches is be very precise and clear about what it is we're talking about how we're going to develop those qualities and then to create meaningful training situations that will bend but not break the athlete. And just like nobody goes into the gym on day one, squats 500 pounds, they go go in, they squat an empty bar. Next week, add five pounds. Next week, add five pounds. And so on until you're at or above the level of competition. If I was to say to you, six months from now, I want you to squat 500 pounds. And in training, we just did 225, 225, 225, 225, 225. We get to the meat desk. All right, you ready, Gary? 500 pounds. Are you going to draw confidence from that? Absolutely not. (laughs) If I get you up to 650, and then I put you in the competition and say, are you ready for 500 pounds? What are you going to say? Oh, I'll I'll absolutely feel like I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. So... Mental toughness is nothing more than the ability to say, I have been here before. Because you and I are not having this conversation in 2020 when they went unbeaten and they destroyed everyone and they won a night. So nobody ever questions the mental toughness of the winner. Now, if you have those four qualities, physical, tactical, technical, psychological, and your total development of all of those qualities is higher than your opponent, you're going to win regardless. Nobody's ever going to question your mental toughness. It's only when you start losing that people question your mental toughness. But you don't know. Is it the execution of skill? Is it the physical qualities? Is it the tactical scheme? You could put a barber and brawler in the UFC tomorrow, super tough. He's going to get his pants pulled down. doesn't matter how tough the other guy is. He's going to win. So... One is, is it actually a mental weakness? You don't know unless you actually go through the process that we just talked about. And two, you know, arguably it's the same team, the same staff that just stomped everyone two years ago. So that's that's where it gets a little crazy, right? Because you mentioned, you know, we're not having this conversation until uh, they begin losing, right? And this this isn't necessarily just an Alabama uh, question, although – it, it has more to do with the fact that it's been a certain way for uh, over a decade, and yeah. obviously there are changes now. Uh, <laughs> but it, there were obviously uh, holes in the team last season. And, and of course, people don't really talk about it because they just find ways to win. But when you really look at what this team was doing last season, it was, oh, they're young, and they'll develop. And they'll be much better. Now, you can obviously look at a lot of different things this season, right? They've had an incredibly difficult road schedule. And the coaching staffs in the SEC are obviously elevating. They are getting much better than than they have been. And the constant churn of assistant coaches at Alabama and Tuscaloosa uh, is, at some point, it is going to hurt. We saw the same thing happen with Bobby Bowden. Uh, and it's not that Nick Saban has reached, you know, that point just yet. But... Yeah. And, it's possible. Yeah, there's a lot of different changes. And the guys, obviously, you didn't see it in 2020, which, you know, I don't think if, if Scott Cochran leaves right after the 2019 season, I think the majority of those guys are still built for the 2020 season. So if they have a certain attitude, and I don't mean to keep bringing up Cochran, but regardless, yeah. uh, that, that team is still built 
already, well, regardless let me, of who you bring let me, in. Uh, let me say a little devil's advocate for you there. Yeah, go ahead. Why would they hire people that were diametrically opposed to Scott Cochran's method of working if he was doing such a great job? Agreed. Agreed. So this is, let's talk about this. Cochran, of course, for eh, between twenty late 2015 and 2019, uh, and this isn't necessarily on Cochran. We, I, you know, I don't know this to be true, uh, but Alabama had to deal with a lot of injuries. Uh, most of, I, I believe, the majority of them were preseason or early season, and some of them were season enders, etc. And a lot of the media uh, pushed that back on, eh, they work them too hard, right? And I, right. I don't necessarily believe that. Um, it's, it's true. Okay, so that's, okay. So I, you know, I don't know this stuff. That's why I got you on here. But yeah. they brought in uh, Dr. Matt Ray, and they bring in David Ballou uh, from Indiana, yeah. and they are whizzes as far as sports science is concerned. And obviously, yeah. they have done a very good job regarding uh, making sure that the players are uh, elevating uh, the way that they're supposed to, and also not being injured in the process. Right? They're not pushing too hard. They're finding a way to uh, to, to reach max potential, I believe. Um, but the difference, I think, between that max potential. And, uh, you know, that nasty streak that I was talking about, I don't know that it's necessarily strength or if it's mental conditioning or if it is assistant. There's there's really no way to uh, really understand where that comes from, right? I, I, like, am I, am I crazy here? Or <laughs> I'm the not sure idea, exactly. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, given what we just talked about five, ten minutes ago. Yeah. There's, there's one phrase again and again that I love, which is you cannot master an environment that you have not inhabited. So given all that we talked about with those uh, psychological qualities and the, the types of training that isolate those qualities and develop them, it shouldn't follow that running until you feel sick and your legs hurt and squatting a barbell is going to transfer to sporting situations. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So to to say that the previous guy responsible for the the running in the barbells was transferring to that, and the current uh, not that I'm putting your words in your mouth, but the, the the current guy is responsible for the running in the squatting of barbells is now responsible for a decline in performance on the field. Neither of them are responsible for that. Gotcha. Who is responsible for that is the sport coaches. So you know head coach, coordinators, assistant coaches, and the types of training scenarios that they are devising to stress those qualities. And I'll give you two examples from uh, real life. This is like coaches that I've met, coaches that I've worked with. I worked with a golf coach, uh, uh, William and Mary. He did, a, he did a round with a Navy SEAL. Tough guy, right? Right. And he said to this golf coach, he said, how do you keep your cool on the green? I just can't handle it. <laughs> and of course, the coach looked at him and was like, I swear you had people trying to shoot you in the face for your career. And, you know, he, he said, he goes, I cannot keep my cool on the green. You know, it just, it kind of gets to me. And, you know, I attempt to do jujitsu now. I went to an, an MMA gym and I was talking to one of the guys there. He was a, a, a pro MMA fighter. And he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, you know, I've just moved to the States, made my, my name in in rugby and he said man those rugby guys are tough you wouldn't catch me on the field and i was like you get locked in a cage to fight another man <laughs> and what it proves to you is it's with all all stimuli if they don't break you with enough repetition become desensitizing think about how you were when you first learned to drive when you were a teenager you're like behind the wheel like this it just white now you're just right? like drinking a coffee you know <laughs> on the phone <laughs> relaxing all that kind of stuff and it's it's because it's just business as usual. You've built those mental calluses that it's just business as usual. So in order to appear mentally tough, it's just about exposure, progressive exposure to the, to the environment you want to be a master of. And that all comes from the sport coaches. Gotcha. What okay, the sport so this scientist does is... Go ahead. Go ahead. Is they are trying to maximize the performance benefit for a given physical cost. If this is the amount that makes a difference, this is the optimal amount, and this is what breaks you, it's 
was Matt's job. It's now Dave's job to always get them to hover around here and say, think about organizing the week this way. Okay, we've done enough today. He's not, he's not dictating the content of the sessions themselves, which is where the value comes from. It's the sport coaches. Now, just like you can do a great job for recruiting for speed, strength, power, muscle, stature, all that kind of stuff. You can recruit people that have a higher baseline mentally and a higher potential ceiling that you can train. You can, you can recruit mental midgets. And my belief is the next frontier of sports recruitment is going to be in the psychological realm. So if you think about the NFL, how often is it that you see a guy that's a bust and the fans or the, the personnel at the team or the coaches like, man, we thought this guy was like a four, three. We drafted him first round and all of a sudden he's slow and weak. Does it ever happen? Yeah. I mean, it's not, not really like the I mean, fast guys are fast. Well, they don't, they don't get slower. It's just that they, they may not be able to transition. Right. I mean, we've seen busts right, right? So, right, yeah. for sure. For sure. You see busts, but it's like, Hey, the guy that was fast at the combine is fast on the oh, field. Oh, yeah, he's, he's always going to be fast. Yes, absolutely. Okay, what, okay. what is the number? Oh, I'll give you my opinion. You may you may agree, you may not. Okay. The two biggest reasons for busts, character, ability to, to play the game. Uh, Yes, okay, so I, I will agree with character. I believe that all of them have the ability to play the game. I think that ability they, to they play the game. They struggle with the transition, right? I, I think it's, yes, it's, it's maybe the mental transition. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So the reason we don't have boss where you're like, man, we thought this guy was so strong, so fast. We drafted him into the league and now he's, he's useless. It's because we have appropriately valid and reliable assessments for how strong is this guy? How big is this guy? How fast is this guy? So we can make meaningful predictions. If he runs a four, three, he's probably going to be fast in the field. We have yet to come up with valid and reliable assessments of what is this guy's character like? What are the mental processes that he is using to become an elite football player? How does he measure up relative to what we already see in the league? And then you can make a meaningful prediction about how he's actually going to transition. It's because you're using a set of beliefs or information to make predictions that just turn out not to be true. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I this, so this you, makes you, a lot more sense. You hear guys, you hear guys where their recruiting process, they will literally ask players like, "Are you a dog?" I've heard <laughs> that firsthand from the NFL. I, I think I think Scott Cochran <laughs> talked yeah. about that quite a bit. Would you, if in any other field, would you write a twenty million dollar check on behalf of your employer, and that would be your due diligence, <laughs> like whether or not you you're fired. a dog? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't believe so. I don't, yeah. I don't believe. So that that that's why it's the next frontier, because yeah. the 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 if you think about it right, it's in business. If everybody knows how good a product or service is, everyone wants it, and they bid up the price. So successful investing and successful business is about okay. You you guys want that over there? I'm going to go against the grain. I'm going to invest in this this this. And having the judgment to know, well, it's they're not not investing in it because it's a terrible idea. They just don't know what I know. And that's where you get the above market returns and you outperform everyone else. So the to me, the next frontier of the, the drafting process is going to be, well, how do we turn every single draft pick into a Tyron Matthew, a Tom Brady, that like diamond in the rough? Do you know something that other teams don't? And right now, the biggest weakness that teams have in recruitment is being able to define and measure the mental as aspect of performance so that when you do draft guys, you're not saying, Oh my God, this guy's character is out of whack. This guy hasn't got the mental goods to make the, the transition. Or even if they do have good character, do they have the, the work ethic to be able to do this? Do they have the, yeah. the understanding to be able to understand what it is that we're trying to get them to do, et cetera. Right. So yeah. that's, so really, I mean, it, it's not just an identity issue at Alabama. It's not just strength and conditioning or not even necessarily uh, all mental, this comes from uh, maybe the complete churn of assistant coaches constantly, which I would imagine we're going to see some more of that after the season. Uh, yeah. But really, it, it's a whole myriad of different things that are going on in Tuscaloosa that would lead uh, to where this does not look 
like the same Alabama team that people have watched for, you know, 15 years under Nick Saban. Would you, and, would you agree with that? Until you, you know, you, you can lap, lap the track as fast as you want. No fan is going to be able to just see a car lap the track slower than it used to and be like, it's the tires. <laughs> what do you have to do? You have to take it in the shop, do the diagnostic testing, do a drag race, do a rumble track, do do an oval, you know, go through a handling course, look at all those elements and be like, okay, maybe it is the tires. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And that's, that's the problem with. So let me, I, I yeah. keep interrupting you and I am so sorry about that. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> so, so this is something that was brought up to me last season when, when of course Alabama was having issues on the offensive line, et cetera. Um, and I've got uh, some guys that are, you know, relatively close to the program down there that said, you know, the, the recruiting philosophy changed for Alabama away from power and and more towards speed. So it's it's like everything is a pendulum where, you know, it was all power and then you're moving to more when Lane Kiffin took over as the offensive coordinator in 2016, uh, when you realized uh, you need a little more speed to be able to keep up with the Johnny Manziels and and whoever else, right? The mobile quarterbacks and, and these super fast spread offenses, et cetera. And then, of course, the pendulum swings all the way over to where it's nothing but speed. It's the reason why Alabama's got four running backs that are all uh, 200 pounds and, and all run, you know, four fours or four fives or whatever, right? It's all speed backs that are not big, but, you know, et cetera, right? It's, it, but that's what the entire thing has shifted to, where the offensive line is no longer uh, set up to be a run-blocking line. They are set up to be a pass-blocking line. It, it's, it's like the whole philosophy has completely shifted, not only – for, you know, the game plans, but also for the coaching. That, to me, feels like something that, you know, you can't just in one season flip it back over. If you go too far, as far as the speed goes, you lose the the physicality. And, you know, at some point, you got to be able to, to bring it back down. It's why, you know, Georgia is not a spread team. Really, they're still a power uh, NFL type of offense. And they've got a lot of speed, but really they are more built for power, right? They're they're just a completely different matchup than what teams are used to seeing for the majority of the season. And I, I guess where I'm going with this is it, once the pendulum swings a little too far, it takes a little while to bring it back. So recruiting philosophy, along with all of these other things tied in, I, this is there's no easy fix for this, right? No free lunch. <laughs> there, there is no. You, you can't have your cake and eat it. Yeah. You want you want you want Derrick Henry's. Derrick Henry's a freak. If you want Derrick Henry size running backs, they're going to be slower. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're going to be slower. Right. Yeah. yeah. And at, I'm guessing when you do have that high turnover of coaches, unless you're recruiting in the same image of the people that you're just replaced, everyone wants their, their pound of flesh. Like, well, this is my philosophy. This is my philosophy. If, if, if the pendulum does swing, like you said, you know, for it, it, it's such a complex way to, it's such a complex task to build a successful sporting organization. But all organizations, it's like that SWOT analysis in business. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Given all the resources that we have available, what can we be really, really good at? That's the coaching philosophy, the recruiting pool, uh, the weather, you know, you, you know, certain certain climates, certain field surfaces are going to lend themselves, to, you know, all these different things. And you have to make them the judgment about what is the best return that we can get on investing in a particular strategy. And yeah, when recruitment has to follow on from that. Okay. We've got guys that are really good at coaching up tempo. We play in a hot climate. We play in a firm surface, all that kind of stuff. Right. Let's go out and recruit lean, fast, smaller guys. Suddenly you come, you know, someone comes in and says, well, actually I believe the complete opposite. Well, are you matching your scheme to your talent, or are you just trying to put a square peg in a round hole? That's a very good point. It's not, it's not yeah. one or the other. You know, sometimes you go to war with the army you have. That is incredibly, incredibly useful. Uh, yeah, you got a good point there. 
Uh, I have kept you way longer than I said that I was going to, but I, I would love to do this again. Let me go ahead and wrap this thing up. I, I always try and keep these shows, you know, a, a little okay, shorter, yeah. uh, but let's, let's go on and wrap it up. You know, Kira, go on and tell everybody where they can find you, et cetera. This has been incredibly educational and I really, really appreciate okay. you for, uh, for helping out here. Uh, I normally tell people if you like memes, Japanese children and uh, jujitsu to just search for rugby strength coach. And if you want the actual information, go to strength coach network, which is my education platform. Strength coach network. Very nice. Kier, I, I can't thank you enough for That's agreeing it. to talk to me. You know, you, ah, you. you didn't attack me uh, the way that a lot did. And I understand where they were coming <laughs> from, uh, but you were yeah. willing to sit down and talk to me and kind of help inform me of exactly what all goes into this. And, and I cannot thank you enough for that. Pleasure. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I want to tell Kier thank you. And look, I appreciate anybody that is willing to educate me on things that I don't necessarily know about. I jump on Twitter. I make observations. I make thoughts. Uh, I don't always know exactly what I'm talking about, but I will put out what I'm thinking about on Twitter all the time. And I was called a clown, and I was uh, made fun of pretty regular, uh, regularly uh, with that tweet that I sent out. But, you know, he was willing to talk to me. He was willing to help me learn and understand exactly what goes into this. And I appreciate him for it. The guy is fantastic. His stuff is awesome. Again, go follow him at rugby underscore STR underscore coach. Or just look him up on Twitter, rugby strength coach. The guy knows his stuff. He is very well connected. Uh, huge network. I, I appreciate him. I appreciate him. I will follow this guy to the end of the earth from here on, because he gave me an opportunity. So, uh, great stuff, of course, on today's show. Let me go ahead and tell you, uh, check out the Valtimary Surf Company. These guys are awesome. I love the shirts. I've got two of them. It is, they have college town shirts, right? So, if you're, you're looking for a surf company shirt from Tuscaloosa or Lincoln, Nebraska or Starkville, Mississippi or Auburn, Alabama, whatever it may be, Go and check them out. ValtimarySurfCo.com. Use the promo code Gary10. You'll get 10% off of your order. The fabric, the material is awesome. It is super comfortable. The designs are great. I highly recommend that you go check them out. There is a link in the description below. So uh, also do me a favor, like the video if you would so kindly, and uh, make sure that you are subscribed to the show. That helps us out here at Winning Cures Everything big time with whatever the algorithms may be. And if you're watching this late in the show, thank you. Thank you for watching all of this. Uh, I try and bring out pretty good content each and every time out. I, I do the best that I can, along with doing the Bet US show, among other things as well. But uh, but definitely, definitely hit subscribe, hit the like button. If you're not already subscribed on the podcast, go ahead and do that one as well. I love what we're doing here. I love what we're doing at Bet US. Hopefully, you guys do as well. Again, the Bet US College Football Show every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And make sure that you are signed up over at BetUS.com. Bet US. America's premier online sports book. They are where the game begins. With that said, we're going to get out of here. A little shorter than usual show, but uh, hey, a lot of information today. This was a good one. And with that said, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully, hopefully, all of you tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show. <laughs>